you clicked on this guide here because you want to know how to get the keenest cut. The ascended pistol that's mainly meant to be for the blades one specialization, but since it's a camp bound ascended, I suppose you can give it to any old character. And you want to know how to get it, so that's why you click on this guide. First, to start off this guide, let's go over some prerequisites you will need in order to actually get this entire collection going in the first place. Number one, and this should be super, super obvious, I'm also going to be putting annotations on the screen right now, the end of Dragon's expansion. Number two, a level 80 character, because in order to get a lot of stuff done in the end of Dragon's, you're going to need a level 80 character, and if you don't have a level 80 character, I guess you can go there, but it's going to be harder going for you because the enemies will be level 80 and smacking you about a lot, thereby killing you. Then, the next thing, which is kind of a prerequisite that you also need, is you will need to go fishing in this collection and collect a certain fish. So, um, in order to do that, getting a fishing skiff will help a lot. I'm going to be putting a link to my video right now, on the screen with, where I go over how you get a fishing rod. I've already made a guide on that. Next up, I'll be putting right about around now a guide that I also made on how to unlock fishing in the first place because as I mentioned before, one of the things you need to do with the collection is fishing. Also, let's just uh, bring up the collection over here, the key is cut and uh, get rid of the inventory panel. And we can go over some of the things that I'm going to also recommend you do because otherwise uh, pretty much you might get spoiled a bit in the story. So as you can see, with certain um, with these certain parts of this collection, it will say stuff like, for the Blades Worn Strength Kit, earned by defeating Jade Brotherhood enemies in the Echo Wild Wilds. What are Jade Brotherhood? They've got to do with the End of Dragon story. There are a certain type of enemy faction you can fight, but that's all I'm going to reveal so far in case you haven't completed the story. That is why what I'd recommend doing is completing the entire End of Dragon story First, because one of the last maps you have to go to, uh, I won't even reveal its name right now to um, keep it from getting spoiled, but pretty much the last map in the End of Dragons expansion, in my opinion, can be quite spoiler heavy. You can go to the other three and not really get spoiled that much because there's not really that much going on there. There's, there's a few enemies here and there that might be a little bit of spoiled, spoilers, but you're basically going there and not having the context of the actual story, thereby not spoiling yourself too much. So I recommend completing the entire story, and that will also give you it will give you access to the last map where you will need to mine a node there to get one of the things. And also, it will let you buy one of the items. Now that all that's out of the way, let's actually get on with the actual collection. So, the first two things we're going to focus on is the blade sworn pistol and the breech loaders. These two are so self-explanatory. I'm not even really going to fully cover them, and you'll see why right about now. So, for the, in order to get the Blade Sworn Pistol, this will be like the first thing you will unlock to even start this collection. And what you have to do is begin training the Warrior's Elite Specialization, the Blade Sworn. Um, in other words, we just go into the training menu here. You can see I've got Blade Sworn all trained up. This is pretty much like unlocking a specialization, any other specialization for any class. You probably have done it hundreds of times by now. If you don't know, I'm going to give you the really quick rundown of it. Pretty much... In order to fill up stuff like this, you need hero points. In order to get hero points, you complete like challenges around the world. Sometimes it's communing where you just channel a bunch of uh, you channel um, a bunch on an energy source, and then it'll complete it, and you get the uh, hero points. Or you defeat some kind of boss or something, and that's known as like a hero challenge. The hero points in the Heart of Thorns, the Path of Fire, and the End of Dragons map give ten each instead of the one in the Central Tyria maps. Which is why I recommend going to one of those two in order to get your hero points. Right, now that that's explained, we can go back over to the Keenest Cut collection. And pretty much, yeah, so you get, by just uh, spending 30 hero points and unlocking the Blade Swan um, uh, specialization in the first place, you will get the pistol. Then for the Breach Loaders, uh, completely train the Blade Swan Elite specialization. So all it means is that if we just go over to the hero panel again, wait, that was the hero panel, and then we go over to training here. Uh, just get enough hero points to fill up this circle completely and train the very end skill and then ta-da, it's done. That's the breach load is unlocked. Now, for the um, next thing we're going to cover is the Humpad Rass. And in order to see what you need to do to get this, 
I'm going to look up the wiki and uh, you can follow along. Just remember that if you get stuck, keep this wiki page open because this wiki page I'm going to bring up shows you exactly where and how to fish this fish. So give me a moment, I'll put a quick cut in the video and get to the wiki page. So here we are on the wiki page for the humphead wrasse. Now, here is where it tells you exactly how you should fish this thing and where you should fish it. First is it's this hint. It says found in the waters of the Satan province, which means uh, it's basically the first map of the end of Dragon Maps, the Satan province. So it's found in the waters anywhere in the Satan province. Next up, it says it's a fishing hole and it's an offshore fish. Pretty much offshore is actual real life term, meaning that the fish itself will be found in the water, like in the sea. It's not going to be found in any river or anything like that. You're not going to find it there. You have to go in the middle of the ocean, pretty much, to find this stuff. Then this thing here, fishing hole, which you can click. I'm not going to click it, though, because I already know what it means. Pretty much fishing hole means you're going to have to find a glowing patch, or maybe not so glowing, patch of water where there's fish jumping out of it. And you need to fish in that place, and that will usually get you better fish. It will also get you the humphead wrasse. If you just fish normally and chuck your lure in the water, then you might, you definitely not get this. Favorite bait for any fish, uh, this will list the bait that you have to have in order to catch this thing. In the humphead wrasse's case, it's not fussy, so it, any bait you're using at all will um, be good. And I'll cover bait in just a moment quite soon. Then time of day, daytime, means that you have to fish this fish in the day. If it's dusk, if it's morning, or if it's nighttime, that's a no-no. Now I'm also going to show you something really useful. If we just click here to get a new tab, and we just go GW2 day, it'll already pop, because, of, because I've already uh, pop, uh, searched this before, it's popping up, and now it says Guild Wars 2 day slash nighttime. And now we click on the first link here to go to the wiki, and this thing here, it, you, I recommend having this open on another tab, and then alt-tabbing to this whenever you need to. This will show you the day and night cycle for everywhere else in Guild Wars 2, everywhere else in the world, and then Canther day and night. Isn't that lovely? So this here basically shows you the times when you can catch the humphead wrasse. Uh, in other words, you'd want to start actually setting up yourself to catch it at around about dawn, so then it can go into day, and then you have an entire Guild Wars 2's day's worth, which is roughly, give or take, um, two hours of time, pretty much. Or maybe not, it says like day is um, around like 70 minutes. You can read the times here, I'm not good with times, just know that once this thing is in the day, then you can actually start catching the humphead wrasse. Now we're going to get back into the game, so I can actually show you what one of the fishing holes looks like so you can find it. Okay, here we are back in the game, I'm standing right next to Lion's Arch, and there's a good reason, I mean, standing in the middle of the place with all the portals for Lion's Arch, where you can get to all the major cities, and there's a good reason I'm doing that. Um, by completing a certain step in the story, you will get this little portal scroll, allowing you to instantly teleport yourself to Arborstone. Arborstone is kind of a big old hub in the End of Dragons, but through a recent patch, this lovely portal here has been put here, and it will allow you to just teleport to Arborstone by just going through it. So we're just going to go to Arborstone like this, because if we were to just use the handy new feature on the map to instantly teleport to anywhere in the End of Dragon expansion, it would cost us a lot of silver. Let me show you what I mean. If we just bring up the map here, and let's just say we were over back in Central Tyria and Lion's Arch here. We can click this button here to go all the way and zip ourselves down to Cantha, and then we can teleport to any of these uh, waypoints here, and as you can see, the waypoint in the Seitung province, which is actually where we want to go, only costs around two silver. This is because um, it, this is because it's way closer to us because we are already in Arborstone thanks to going to the place with Lion's Arch. If we didn't use this method, it would cost around roughly six silver to get to um. Uh, the end of drag, like any of the end of dragon the maps in the first place. So I'm basically showing you this to save you a lot of silver in the long run. So um, do you remember me saying before where uh, I was talking about basically how I have a guide on how to do fishing in Guild Wars 2, and I have a also a guide on how to get your very own skiff? Well, I, if you haven't watched those already and you didn't choose to click them, I'd say you should very like really should click them now because we're going to be using a skiff in order to find this fishing spot I was talking about. 
So let me just bring out my skiff here, go into the water, and uh, deploy it. Right, so now that we're in, uh, we're in the skiff, we're going to try and find a good place to fish and a, an offshore location at that. So here, I'm not really sure if this counts as the open ocean. So to be on the safe side, we're just going to go all the way out here because that is pretty much where I found my humpad wrasse because I've already completed this part of the collection. So I'm just going to um, just activate a speed boost on my skiff. If you haven't got this unlocked already, don't worry. It just You unlock it eventually through getting masteries in the game. And after you got enough of them, mastery points, you'll be able to unlock your fishing skip ability. Like to, to have it, to uh, give it, uh, make it go faster in general, and also um, activate that boost you see in there, which uh, is affected by the skip's endurance bar, the yellow bar. I'm going to put a little circle around the screen now. Yeah, so if we don't find a fishing hole real soon, then I'm going to... Okay, good, here's a fishing hole. So... Pretty much, uh, what you're going to want to do now is drive your skip and skip and kind of sidle alongside of it. Uh, you go at like the slowest speed if that's if that's uh, if you have it unlocked. We well, know you would have it unlocked. You would have the slowest speed unlocked. Then we're going to press zero uh, on our keyboard, or in this case, I just press the thumbstick on my controller because it is it makes it, uh, pressing pressing zero, and it's going to put, bring our fishing skip to a stop. And then we're going to either press J or just go to this um, mastery like this thing here. And then we're going to start fishing. It says here I don't have any fishing bait equipped, but that's okay because I had some there, so I'm just going to quit. Yeah, and now we here we have our fishing rod out. Now you just uh, press 1 to activate this, like, uh, aiming reticle. And then you uh, cast it in the water. And then you pretty much wait for the fishing bobber to bob. Any moment now, yeah. And now you can either use A and D to uh, make this bar go backwards. And basically, you're meant to keep the bar on the green bar there. And actually caught a rare fish there. And this is pretty much what you do. You just keep fishing, but make sure you do it in the day. And eventually, you will catch the humphead wrasse. So, done. That is the first part of this collection done and explained. You know everything about that. Let's move on to the next part now. Okay, so for the next part of the collection, we're going to focus on the Badge of the Blade Swarm because it is already about doing something else in the Seijing province. And I mean, we're already here, so let's focus on it. It is, you have, what you have to do to get it is defeat the Leviathan in the Seijing province. The Leviathan is uh, kind of functions a bit like a boss. It generally spawns around here, near this island over here, so let me just slowly turn the boat around so I can go over there. And it also sometimes potentially spawns right over here. How you actually get it to spawn is you just end up fishing a lot in a lot of these fishing holes. So generally the more players there are on the map, the more likely the Leviathan will be able to spawn. And a big bunch of either white or orange text will appear on the screen saying that overfishing has attracted the, uh, the attention of something very dangerous. The game is referring to Leviathan. I'm going to get try and get footage to uh, like of me fighting the Leviathan and putting it in here. Also, if map, the map seems to be um, kind of dead, you can always try uh, and ask in map chat if anyone is fighting Leviathan. Pay attention to commander tags. If one is around here or around here, then they're most likely fighting Leviathan. And also, if you open the looking for group tab, that's Y, by the way, and then we go into the End of Dragons expansion and Satan Province, here... You see, there's actually one which here says Levy Farm, which means like Leviathan Farm, I'm pretty sure. So I'm going to join it, and now everyone is in a different instance than me. So I'm just going to right-click one of their names, and then... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I get this. Apparently they're doing a Leviathan Farm, and it's in um, New Kining City. So, unfortunately, the, I um, you won't be able to get the actual... Um, uh, thing or like the actual blade sworn badge by doing this leviathan because the collection specifically states that you have to kill the leviathan in the Seitung province otherwise this isn't going to work but i'm still going to record me fighting the leviathan because then you can actually have a uh, like a first hand uh, experience fighting it and know what i was talking about before when it, like swallows you and stuff So as you can see, here is the commander tag, and Leviathan is underwater. You won't need a skimmer like I have if you wish to fight it 
it's just down here. So one of the things I really, really recommend for fighting Leviathan is a ranged weapon of certain sorts. Example right here, I'm using a harpoon gun on a warrior. And it also works with ranges, but generally the reason why I recommend a ranged weapon is because the Leviathan is really huge, and you kind of need to hit the very front of it for it to even, like, count as damaging it. You can see a lot of my hits there were just counted as obstructing it. And, yeah, in general, swimming around kind of like this kind of facing the Leviathan is a good idea. Also, any abilities such as the one I've got here on my mark will, um, that, that causes, um, vulnerability to the Leviathan is a good idea. You want to keep your stacks at, like, basically constantly at, uh, around the maximum, which is, uh, 25 vulnerability. Yeah, as you can see, it's generally, um, dying somewhat quickly. Also, there is usually a bunch of Naga around the area, so just try and avoid them, it, um, and either just, uh, beat them off by pushing them back with some kind of crowd control ability, or... If you um, can't be bothered to do that, just swim away. But I'm actually going to try and get eaten by the Leviathan now, so I can um, show you what I mean. Oh, it actually didn't eat me. So, this, since this is pretty much all that really is to the fight, I'm just going to put a cut in here now and get back to you once the Leviathan actually eats me. Because other than that tail swish there, there's nothing really else that you should uh, worry about with the fight. Oh yeah, by the way, that tail swish, it's big, it's huge, but it is telegraphed by the Leviathan. And also, you can... Uh, just straight up dodge it like so see that time I actually dodged it correctly And it said evaded instead of me taking a heap of damage So like I mentioned before I'm gonna put a cut in and actually get eaten by the Leviathan So I can show you the mechanics of trying to get out of its mouth So I'll see you then Okay, apparently I got eaten so quickly I didn't even need to put a cut in so as you can see these here are attack spots and you might not even know you can be able to get out of here. It happened the first time to me. Because there's a constant debuff on you where basically you're getting eaten by the Leviathan's um, stomach acid. And there's also a force that keeps on pulling you back to the back of the Leviathan, as you can see here. Because um, it's, yeah, it's trying to eat you. So this is like, I don't know, the inside gullet of the Leviathan. And I've actually pretty much died here. So in order to actually even get out of being eaten by the Leviathan, you generally need a lot of players present to even attack attack, attack spots in the first place. So what generally ends up happening is that you might get eaten once or twice and die. In that case, I recommend just going back to the nearest waypoint and going back to the Leviathan. Because um, some people like to wait around on the floor for other people to revive them when in events like this. Don't do that here, because for that to happen, they would have to get eaten by the Leviathan themselves. And that's generally a bad thing everyone wants to avoid. So just in general, kill the Leviathan normally. Right, so the Leviathan is um, killed, uh, as I mentioned before in the collection, and the next thing we're immediately going to do is the, um, basically the new Kining Blackout. So, this is a meta event, and I've unfortunately just gone, I've just spawned at the very end of it, but this very end of it is the part where it includes the boss, and the part that actually matters, because the because the uh, other parts are pretty much just going around and defeating a random bunch of enemies and just like, a few champion enemies and stuff like that. So this is the part that really matters. And yes, this meta is also tied to a um, part of the Blade Sworn collection. The reason why I'm just going right over here and not even explaining how you get to this part of the city or anything like that is because I'm kind of rushing to get there. And also why I'm just using a sky scale and like really not explaining how to traverse the city at all is because I'm kind of rushing to get there because the event just happened to be going on when I was recording. And frankly, I don't want to spend a heap of time waiting for it to come around when I can um, record it now. And uh, I suppose it doesn't really matter too much that I'm going to be uh, covering how to do this part of the um, collection before I cover how to actually map complete New Kinding City because... You can just use the timestamps that will provide in the playback bar to skip past it. So pretty much we're going inside this basically giant jade battery reactor place. And a bunch of jade brotherhood enemies here will actually uh, start attacking us. And uh, let me just check the collection again because there might actually be one thing you have to do by killing... Oh, okay, yeah. Apparently, you have to, do have to kill Jade Brotherhood areas, but again, we're running into the same problem as last time. They're in the wrong area. So these may be Jade Brotherhood here, 
but they are you have to kill them in the Echo Violet Wilds and not um right here. So this Meta Portal, it apparently is just making all these Jade Brotherhood come out of it. So I was trying to take it before because I actually haven't done this map method too many times, but apparently you can't just take it and just go where you want with it. You the only all that can come out of it is the Jade Brotherhood. But this is a good thing still because that means we can just camp the Jade Brotherhood at this little portal here. So this shouldn't take really too long to actually um, defeat them all, but I'm going to put a cut in here anyway because you don't need to see me standing around a few portals and such, just waiting until all the Jade Brotherhood are defeated because uh, you see this bar on the side of the screen. Yeah, we have to prevent the batteries from being stolen around here, and the Jade Brotherhood are coming out of these portals to steal the batteries. So it's a simple case of stop the dude from getting there, or gal from getting there, and chop them up, good, or shoot them, or whatever. So like I said before, putting a cut in now, and getting to the end of this part of the meta after these Jade Brotherhood are defeated. Okay, this is uh, right after the uh, well, that event is completed, and uh, apparently we have two labs we have to secure. So I'm going to immediately rush to the other lab as well, and uh, it will generally be shown in the map by a big red circle. And um, I recommend doing the same thing. In fact, the commander has actually teleported there. And the reason why I recommend doing that is because if these two, like if the events centered around these two labs, uh, um, turned out to fail, then we would lose the entire meta. And also, we have a only like four minutes or so to actually get this done. So that's why I'm just going over here. Uh, I think I'm going to put a quick cut in here until I actually get to said lab because all this city traversal is probably going to be mind-boggling for you anyway. Or m might be, I don't know. But I haven't really covered how to actually traverse kinding properly or what I'm actually doing or what mount I've even using. So I'll um, put another cut in here and get back to you once I've actually gotten to the second lab and hopefully the meta hasn't failed. Okay, so a small update here. I wasn't actually um, able to get to the second lab. I think the commander was using some kind of teleporter or something, but I'm following the pink commander right now, and pretty much the lab event that the green commander was commanding where I wasn't at was successful, so yay for us. Now, um, I'm, we're pretty much just uh, meant to be going and escorting some kind of NPC. So you can actually see up there, like, Yao, Yao and uh, Mizuki, two NPCs were meant to be escorting. Um, I'm actually not sure exactly where they'll show up, but I guess I'm just actually pretty much show, uh, following the commander for now, because they seem to really know where they're going, what they're doing. Yeah, so just putting another card in here, and uh, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you once the NPC is actually um, spawned. And they have spawned. We're apparently following um, uh, the uh, other one, not Yao, but um, Mizu. I think, yeah, Officer Mizuki. And this is an escort quest, so even without having done this meta much, I am can I can pretty safely say that there will any, any, be enemies spawning, which you have to fight off in order to finish said escort. Because um, I doubt it would be an actual escort if there was nothing to fight, that's just only how the game goes. Oh, and apparently she's also using her very own dragon, so if you don't have a mount at this point, it may be really difficult to keep up. Yep, and here's the said enemies. Oh my god, my frame rate, it's dying. In that case, you may actually want to turn down your graphic settings a little bit for this kind of stuff. I mean, at least I've played the game enough that I can tell what's going on, but still, uh, I've got the graphics with the highest settings, so that's why this place looks like a mess and everything's so choppy. There is so much trying to be rendered, and this isn't even the maximum people that can spawn, because everyone else is over at the Greek command right now. Yeah, so if you are struggling at this part, and you really can't tell what's going on, uh, generally a lot of enemies will spawn here. And I rec would recommend just using a ranged weapon, uh, sitting at range, and generally using area effect stuff to fire into the group, into the huge just this bunch of stuff, and you probably hit something. Because all you have to do is make sure Yao and Mizuki have their health kept alive. And again, this part here will have um, a time limit. Like, if you fail to do all this within the time limit, the entire event will fail. 
Also an important note when doing this kind of event, generally, um, NPCs will occasionally double back on where they're gone because the pathfinding is just weird. There's a meta called the Orkery Rock meta, and that is notorious for the NPC there bugging out when people make her go too fast with super speed, and then she'll like loop back around us on herself. Just pay attention to where the enemy, uh, I mean the NPC is, and generally follow the commander, and you should be good and golden. And, you know, I'm recognizing this is like real kind of just same old, same old. So, uh. I'm going to put another cut in here and um, and get back to you once we actually add a uh, different part of the map because this so far is all very self-explanatory so I'm going to get back to you when there's actually something different different that's happening that I really should start explaining. Right, we're back. I decided to skip ahead to the final part of the meta because pretty much all that was going on was we were just going to multiple different substations, capturing them, defeated enemies, defeated more enemies. It just took a decent while. But it was just nothing really but mindless killing. And now here we finally are at the final place. I'm going to put one last quick cut in here. Not for the end of the video, but just one last quick cut. So that when we get back, we're actually fighting the final big boss of this meta. And then I can uh, move on to the next part of the collection. Because I'm guessing you don't want to uh, sit here and wait forever for me to just uh, finish this meta. So I'm going to quick cut in. I'll get back to you once I'm actually fighting the final boss. I'll go over how to defeat it. And then that should be uh, the meta over after that. And here we are on the final part of the meta. Uh, the command attack said some important stuff here, which was dodge the stomp attack. So I'm guessing there's going to be some kind of tell from this thing here where it does some kind of stomp attack. In fact, I think that might be it. It's kind of hard to tell because uh, my frame rate is tanking here. The uh, command attack also said dodge the bad stuff on the floor, like the red stuff, which I mean, if you played any type of MMO or anything, uh, That'd be simple, pretty self-explanatory. I'm also really glad that I actually uh, my, I picked my uh, elite skill as a bombardment, citadel bombardment, because I'm playing a char here, so pretty much uh, somehow my warband is able to reinforce me all the way out from Canva and <laughs> bombard this big corrupted jade behemoth. And the reason why I'm saying it was so great is because, well, normally there's a, I have to deal with a um, very... Uh, large area that all the bombs come down on, but this boss here is so big that um, all the bombs pretty much hit it. Also, I'd say pay attention to what the commander is calling out here. Oh, I guess that was the stomp there. And apparently I kind of just stood there and it didn't really matter, I guess. Ah, so here... Um, I just read over what it says to do on the side of the screen. So there's a, a jade capacitor over here, and uh, well, I got there a little too late. But we're basically meant to destroy it because it was uh, shielding the jade beat north over here. And I've got a feeling that it was invincible when um, the capacitor was shielding it. And there, as you can see, of course, it was it's just like um, Dracania, Dracadian is saying, "Oh, like rip my FPS," <laughs> pretty much. Like, me plus meta equals one uh, frames per second. Like, I feel you, buddy. I feel you. Oh, yeah, also general tip is, um... If you've got any abilities, such as, like, I got one warrior ability right here that lets me, um, get to stab with my sword. And if I, um... If I go and stab the enemy, an enemy when they are 50% health or lower, then it does a lot of bleeding stacks. So any any abilities you have like that where I work on bosses and, uh, well, I mean, not not... If they work on bosses. They will work on bosses, and I recommend using any abilities like that um, as many times as you can on a boss like this because it's going to do so much difference on something that's that he is huge and has this much health. So, I'm glad we're kind of spreading out here because my frame, for my frames are getting slightly better. Oh, no, wait, never mind, never mind. They're back to being just wrong, wrong again. Oh, and uh, apparently, yeah, I was actually just, uh, I was just jumping to get to the fight quicker, but I accidentally jumped over one of the, um, whatchamacallits. I accidentally jumped over one of the actual slams. Yeah, and I, this pretty much covers it. If everyone's doing their job correctly, like um, like um, they're doing here, then this boss should be defeated pretty soon. Okay, so I'm back and attack, being attacked by some turtle dude because apparently um, these Kappa mud stompers here do uh, they end up just spawn? Can, they can spawn apparently right after the entire meta event's over, and most people have left the area, so it's mainly just me and them. The main reason why I actually even am recording here is because next to this black line merchant someone dropped, generally in a circle around here where I'm walking, 
there are a bunch of extra chests, so just keep out for that once you finish the meta event, because that will generally give you some extra loot, and I don't want you missing out on um, any extra loot. Now, another quick thing I want to cover, right before we go to the very um, starting waypoint for New Kining City, is um, the choice chest that you get for completing this. So here we are, the New Kining City Hero's Choice Chest. And I'm mainly covering this because there's rewards you can pick from. I'd recommend either picking the Amalgamated Gemstone because it's worth the most. And if you once, for example, wanted a Jane Rude Stone, that you could just sell an Amalgamated Gemstone because it's worth more than the Trading Post and buy yourself a Jade one. Or this um, Sun's Armor Recipe Book for crafting armor with the um, Dragon Stat combination. And you can look that up on the wiki. In fact, I'm just going to put a, a quick little cut, to, a shortcut to the wiki showing you the stats you can get from that. But that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Uh, personally here, I think I'm going to pick the uh, Sun's Armor book because I want to learn how to craft that kind of stuff. And then I'm going to use it and open it later. But enough about that. On to the actual next part of the co uh, collection. And that is Map Completing New Kining. Uh, the next, one of the next parts of the collection is map completing new kining. So that map, map completion, if you didn't know already, basically means that you should do every single one of the hearts here and do every single one of the points of interest as well and um, also get every single vista here. Just complete everything got to do with new kining. So I'm not going to cover all of that because if I did, it would take forever and this guide would be way longer than it already is. So I'm going to cover some quick tips here in order to traverse New Kining. So one of the first things I recommend, um, if you already have it, is to traverse New Kining with a Sky Scale. Yes, I know a Sky Scale is a huge investment. It takes absolutely forever to get. But if you don't have a Sky Scale, at least get yourself a Springer with the level 3 Jumping Mastery, which can be acquired in Path of Fire. Uh, I um, apologize if you're a bit frustrated now hearing that this is what I recommend, but you can get through this entire city without that. This is a recommendation, not a have to. The main reason why is because, as you can see here, I'm generally jumping on top of buildings, and you can sometimes potentially jump yourself up so high, you're able to bypass stairs and stuff, and take a way more direct path to a place in order to get there. And then... The other thing I want to cover is another method of traversing New Kining. So, there's actually a really great example if we just go over to this waypoint here. Now, this waypoint here has a heart that's all about using Jade Tech and learning how to use it. And uh, if, you comp if you do the story and get up to here, you'll also be given a free level 1 Jade Core. And a Jade Core can be used to access your Jade Bot. In fact, as you can see here, apparently I already have a um, level 1 Jade Core in my Jade Bot. And the reason why I recommend getting that is because we're just going to go around until we find one here. Uh, a lot of maps in um, End of Dragons have these things called Jade Tech Zip Lines. And if we have a Jade Core in our Jade Bot, we're able to zip all the way up here, and then sometimes like one zip line will lead to another zip line, as you can see here. And they're just generally really good at traversing the entire city. So, the way you get a Jade Core is either playing up to the point in the story where you have to, you're told to go to this waypoint and get yourself a fandangled new Jade Bot, or we're just going to open up the Black Lion Trading Company here, go to Trading Post, and then type in the word Jade. In fact, we're just going to type in the full name, Jade Core. And as you can see here, there are a number of Jade Bot Cores you can buy. Uh, generally, um, the higher level the Jade Bot Core, the more um, secondary modules you can fit in the Jade Bot. But just to get the Jade Bot to function, you just want to buy a Jade Bot Core 1, uh, Tier 1, which is the cheapest. And yes, I know that's not very cheap, but trust me when I say it's worth it, Just I suggest doing the daily and getting yourself a Jade Bot Core. And um, then once you have it, you need to install it at a Jade Bot um, way station. So looking on the map here, that is what they are. Actually, I said it wrong. It's not a way station, it's a workbench. So you just look for this symbol here. I think there is one in the new Ender Dragons Guild Hall. 
and you access it there by going up to it and pressing F to use the workbench. And now here, as you can see, we can actually unequip and re-equip our Jade Bot Core Tier 1. Just drag it over here and then once it's slotted in, you should now be able to go on the zip lines. And that is pretty much all I'm really going to cover for completing the, the new kining, in the entire new kining map. Just go to each individual um, heart, do them, and if you get stuck, I suggest looking that stuff up on the, on the wiki. I'm sorry that I'm not going to be covering this in any more detail, but we're going to be at this guide forever. There's actually just one last tip that I'm going to recommend for completing this place, and that's if you are planning to map complete new kining, and it's too much for you to do all in one go, focus on the hearts, since there are only three of them in this map. We just zoom out, as you can see here, three out of three hearts, and do all of them in one go. This is because the hearts around here, uh, uh, this is because, um, wait, actually, never mind, that's, that's not the case. I was going to say the hearts around here can be repeatable, so you might be confused and do them twice, but actually the hearts around here aren't repeatable. It still is a good idea, in my opinion, to do all three hearts, because then you're not left guessing which one you left uncompleted, then you have to open the map, go over there, and complete it. If you complete all three, that's a single part of this, uh, that's like a big part of this uh, map completion done. Okay, that was a mouthful. Now that the map completion is over, we can move on to the next part of this collection. Okay, so here we are in the Echo Vard Wilds, um, pretty much in Arbor, near Arborstone again. So remember I told you you can use that teleporter to get to Arborstone. There is Arborstone. We've just gone outside the front portal and we're now in the Echo Vard Wilds. I'm going to cover the harder thing to do here. Um, because I think I should cover that first before I cover the um, easier thing. And unfortunately, like I mentioned, this well, yeah, it's going to be a bit hard. So we're going to, to go for the speed loading manual. That's going to be the next part of this um, this collection. And it says here, hint purchase from the map currency vendor in the Echo Vard Wild. I actually have to look up at this on the, up on the wiki because this here doesn't really tell you anything in my opinion. So here we are with a quick cut to the wiki and I'm going to explain it in detail there. Okay, so here we are on the wiki, and this is why I mentioned it's going to be kind of difficult. The vendors you need to buy this from are either um, Ekio um, Broadcrest or Kestrel Michiko, and they require you to complete one of two hearts, and in my opinion, both hearts are a bit of a pain in the behind to do. They also need a few things that you can buy with this kind of stuff. I mean, we will need a few things, or they need a few items and stuff to buy them. That's what I was trying to say. So the first thing you, they will need is 21,000 karma. You can find plenty of good guides out there on how to get karma. I'm not going to cover it here because they would do a way better job than me. And these things, these whatever red letter things in are, uh, I'm just going to click it to learn what the name of this thing is. Okay, so after the quick cut, yeah, apparently an imperial favor. Yeah, that's what this thing is called. And uh, pretty much how this thing works is that by, just by completing events and opening all of these different um, caches, wherever they may be, you will um, gain a lot of them. And you will need a hundred of, of them, but it shouldn't take that long to get them through events. Now that that's covered, I'm going to show you the location where both things are located. And then we're going to cover how to actually do each of the two hearts in case you wanted to pick one out of the two really annoying methods to get this thing done. So here we are back in game, standing right where we were before, uh, right outside the Arbor Stone. Yes, yes, that's the word I was looking for. And the closest one of these um, hearts that you can complete is over here. It involves sabotaging a bunch of Jade Brotherhood forces which will be required anyway to complete the story. So I actually recommend you might as well be going through the story and completing this part. But if, in case you're up to that part of the story and like doing this guide and you're a bit confused on how to complete the heart, then I'm still covering it here. So we're just trying to get over here, uh, over to the junkyard waypoint. Uh, you can see where I went on the map. So I'm just using a regular old map like a jackal. 
it pretty much this offers not too many different movement abilities to just normally walking around except for a few quick teleports forward but i mean hey i'm not jumping up on like really high places or literally flying in the air so this shouldn't be too hard to follow apparently that was kind of the wrong way to go i need to go down here i'm, I'm starting to remember this place now yeah the jade brotherhood camp is over here and apparently the heart doesn't actually show up on the map until you get really close but yeah this is the guy we're looking for and oh oh dear there's apparently a boss in the area so um yeah we're just going to try and uh, ignore that for now as much as we can and what we're going to try and do is just kind of zip past the boss this can get really annoying yes i know talk to the um invisible person here and then you can say yes i'm ready to be disguised and then you just pick one of these disguises and immediately run in there and avoid the boss you have three options for the disguise it doesn't really matter what you pick but i'm just trying to get away from all these damn jade brotherhood stuff you have to fight outside the entrance Oh god, they're following me in. This wasn't part of the plan at all. Well, I guess, I mean, good thing I'm recording, because now you know they will follow you all the way in. Right, and now that you're inside, it's time to get sabotaging. Okay, so for the basic premise of sabotaging, um, pretty much how this works is you're trying to keep up with the appearance that you are Jade Brotherhood, and you're trying not to actually get... No, uh, and you're trying not to actually get noticed by the actual Jade Brotherhood here. So, what you're meant to do is do stuff like you see these tactician supplies here. You're meant to like pick them up and steal them and carry them away and just basically sabotage this place. So we're going to look here for a uh, either a waste disposal place or in this case, I guess we've put the tactician supplies in the wiring and just like jammed it in and probably bashed it in with a wrench too and pretty much uh, wrecked the place. I think there's also a way to get up to a second lev um, level around here, like a bunch of stairs. And yeah, you can generally um, you can generally use that to get up higher to the second, uh, to the higher places of it, because as you can see there, I tried to use my mount and it just straight up didn't work. I wasn't able to use my mount. And also you can do other stuff like switching off Jade Lantern, but the reason why actually not is because as you notice when I go close to this, there's like a ring around me and the ring will basically let you know when one of these um, more suspicious Jade Brotherhood guards and such are near you. So what you want to do is do all the sabotaging when no one is near you. And if you're able to do it really stealthily, it's an achievement. But if you don't care about the achievement, then don't worry too much about generally trying to steal Jade repair kits and that kind of stuff. Because if you are caught too many times while doing this, then all that will end up happening really is um, they will throw you out of the camp and then you have to go back in. And that is generally the general premise of sabotaging this place. There is a lot of places to look. I'm not going to cover all of the things you have to do in here. I'm going to give you basically a quick, quick briefing like I did with this then. Because if I covered it all, it would take far, far too long. And this guide would be going on for too long. Another thing I just wanted to mention is there was some enemies that followed me in outside here. And I just wanted to tell you that while fighting them off camera, it didn't raise my suspicion. Because I suppose all the Jade Brotherhood inside there just thought I was um, having a like internal fight with a bunch of other Jade Brotherhood. And they are kind of like a gang. Like a... Um, like an Italian mob game, for instance. They got that kind of vibe with them. So I guess they think the fighting is normal. They don't really care. So basically keep on sabotaging that place. And then when you're done, you'll be able to buy the um, item off this person here. That's the heart vendor. But I'm right now going to just go over to the other place. We're going to try and run all the way over to the Mori village. Because that is the other place you can go in order to buy this item. The one you need with the Imperial Favors. Like the... the, the the jade loading manual or whatever you call it yeah so what i'm doing here is i'm generally just taking the direct path down here and going down here and then i plan to keep going and then take a bit of a right and go through that swampy part there the reason why i'm actually going here in the first place and showing you is because i have this map fully unlocked 
and you may have no idea where to go when first going here because everything is unexplored and I'm going to basically help you explore it with me. So here again, you can see just where my little pips have been going and we're going to keep on going down. So the uh, while we're getting there, I might as well talk a little bit about the Mori village and the Mori heart before we end up arriving there. So the good news is that if you are terrible at stealthy gameplay and trying to sabotage stuff, the um, Mori village involves no such sabotage. However, the annoying thing about this heart is that a bunch of the steps are very, very unclear. In fact, when I was doing the heart, I only managed to do a few steps here and there and just repeated the same thing over and over and over to get the heart done. Yeah, so as you can see, I went down here, follow, which is following my pips, and uh, that was like the kind of last place I opened the map, so I just went down here, and now here we are going to Mori Village. Uh, also good news is that Mori Village has a waypoint, so if you happen to get really sick of doing the collection and wanted to stop here and take a break for the night or whatever and get yourself some ice cream or whatever, then um, get the waypoint and you can easily come back here later for only a short fee of silver. I mean a small fee, not short. So now that we're actually here, pretty much interacting with a number of uh, basically Tengu bird people here will um, let you complete the heart. So one of the easiest ways of doing it is you talk to the suspicious Tengu and basically say, yeah, you, you, like, you suspicious Tengu, stop. The, he's actually part of the gang. So basically you say, stop trying to manipulate the youngins, will you? And then he's like, no, I'm not going to. And you're like, yes, you are. I'm going to beat some damn sense into you. And then you proceed to beat the damn sense into him. Like so. So this is pretty much just one of the average, I call just, uh, well, combat parts of the hearts. It's generally pretty easy. You just beat up the speaker warriors or the suspicious um, Tengu. And then um, that's one way to fill up. As you can see here, tiny part of the heart. Another way is also actually talking to said youngster. I think this impressionable one doesn't actually want to talk to me because I just beat up his his potential mentor right mentor right in front of his face. You can also talk to these wary Mori villagers and you can say, oh, "Sorry, I just wanted to learn more." But basically, um, let me just get out of this dialogue so I can go into it again, so it's not going so quickly, so you can actually read it. So you talk to him and he's like. What do you want in kind of a despondent way? Because he's all wary and doesn't want outsiders messing up his village. And you say, sorry, I just wanted to connect. I'm not really eager to connect with outsiders. They always want something from us. What is it that you want? And then you can say a number of things, a powerful alliance, uh, so th uh, to make sure the Minister of Purity and its like never rise again, to help you live in a way you can um, earn a place in the sky above the sky. But I'm going to say this stuff about sky and... He says, you've taken the um, time to learn a little about us. That's a good sign. Keep it up. And then you can say, I will. And that basically ends the conversation. Um, there are, however, um, options you can pick, such as if you pick something like a uh, powerful alliance will benefit us both. He says, uh-huh, uh -huh, um, uh -huh. it will benefit us both. Are you a speaker or a member of the Brotherhood? And then he would say basically, uh-oh, because he's like, oh, I can see right through you in the shitty disguise. You're part of the gang. When really, you just used a bunch of wording that the gangs usually use, and then they're like, oh, oh get out of our village, stop trying to crop, uh, crop out youngsters, when really, you aren't. You're trying to be a good person here, but the village is just all angsty and not trusting people, and that's why they attacked you. Uh, yeah, they're actually a good fight. I mean, by that I mean, they're kind of deadly, and I would have almost gone down here. Also, I rolled backwards into the fire. Don't do that. This stuff actually can, like fully down you. In fact, I'm just waiting for my health to recharge a bit, and, uh... Yeah, as you can see, ow, fire hurt it bad. I'm showing you that because occasionally, um... Pretty much, uh, there's some fire in the game which straight up doesn't hurt you, so you never know until you try it. <laughs> That's such a stupid way of wording it, but whatever. And then here, of course, you have impressionable youngsters. So... Uh, pretty much you can pick one of the two options and then uh, this young these young impressionable youngsters will always have the same dialogue So I'm just gonna pick the bottom one when he says like he's basically talking about a lot of the, do people ever stop being selfish without being forced in and like no in my experience people um, never change and apparently Going to the game that it wasn't the right option when really that's an opinion you're fair to have your character should be able to have I, I think they should maybe do that part a little differently anyway the option you only have two options with the youngsters and uh, once you pick the right one, you can pretty much go to that over and over and over again, and just youngsters over and over again, and um, 
in general, just uh, keep picking the same options to slowly raise the bar. Also, I mean, like the heart bar there. The last way of completing this heart is fighting stuff and making the village safer. Now, what they don't really tell you that, but um, they don't really explain that well, is that all the dangerous stuff is actually out here in this swamp, and you're meant to just go out here and fight something that could be potentially dangerous to the village. I'm guessing not these wallows here, which should be actually something that's um actually ready to kill them, like a non-neutral mob. And you know you're in the wrong place when this um wait, wrong thing when this. Uh, heart bar over here straight up disappears. In fact, here. Thank you, Drake. Normally I get really up, uh, I'm frustrated when these things attack me, but in this case, I'm glad it did because this Drake here is a scaled Drake is exactly the kind of thing which we want to be fighting. And once we defeat it, I'm guessing the heart will go up a little bit because the tank would like us more because we've helped keep the village safe when really all we're trying to do is just kind of just fill up the heart here and just we're intentionally going out here to fight drinks to do that. We haven't accidentally stumbled on anything. Ah, oh, so what happened there is a mistake that uh, I don't, um, I wouldn't blame anyone for making. Pretty much while fighting the Drake, I done the uh, smart tactic of I backed up. Uh, basically, I was using the ability, this one here, and it shot me backwards while shooting a harpoon. That accidentally made me go right out of the heart area. So if we swim close enough over here, around here, just here, is where you have to pretty much be fighting enemies for them to be deemed a threat to the village. So you may have to kite drakes back into this area and kill them there, or just focus on killing the skilled drakes around this area here in order to fill up the heart. And that's a quick primer on both of the hearts um, and how to complete them. Now we can move on to the next part of the collection. And this is, I'm pretty sure, it's just going to involve killing a whole heap of Jade Brotherhood enemies. So, let's just go back into the Keenest Cut collection and double check. Yes, the Bladesworn Trinkets, earned by defeating Jade Brotherhood enemies in the Echovard Wilds. So, if we just use our brain here, where do we know the Jade Brotherhood is located? Next to the heart we just done. And what happens a lot of the times, like I just mentioned? Well, the Jade Brotherhood run in here and attack you. What did we also see outside here? That's right, a champion event. In other words, if you just use your head, you can pretty quickly figure out that um, this area of the map, by design, would probably have a lot of Jade Brotherhood in it. And that's mostly true, because I've ran around here and found a heap of Jade Brotherhood. In fact, if you just follow the roads around here, then you can generally, like I'm doing right now with my Raptor, you can generally find a bunch of Jade Brotherhood patrols. Here's one. He's a Jade Brotherhood servitor. Uh, another Jade Brotherhood person. Uh, Jade Brotherhood scrapper over here. Who seems to be, um, I guess a bit brain dead. <laughs> she's running away when she's got a hammer. So I'm like, lady, you're not going to hit me if you run away with the melee weapon. Whee! Yep. She's just running back and forth. She's totally crazy. <laughs> Doesn't know what the... Okay, she... Congratulations, ma'am. You have attacked me once. I have shot you like five times and chopped you too. You are terrible at this. And I just killed your friend. Yeah, so generally, um... Defeat the Jade Brotherhood, and you may need to defeat a lot of them to do this. I lost count of how many I needed to do, but, uh... I don't think... It felt like it wasn't around, like, 40. It was probably a bit less, but, yeah, in general... You probably need to defeat a whole bunch of Jade Brotherhood in order to get this trinket here and complete the collection. But that generally is all there really is to it. Just defeat Jade Brotherhood, keep at it, and soon enough you get your little trinket. It um, just depends on when it drops. And then also it's a um, exotic trinket, so you can select the stats of it, which, pretty, which is pretty neat. And that pretty much, uh, I know it's really short, but that's all you really need to cover for the Bladesworn trinket. So, this is pretty much um, most of the things done. I'm now going to cover the Bladesworn authorization papers because once you start getting uh, past these few things, you, a lot of the things will then start involving the last map in the End of Dragons expansion. And like I mentioned at the start of the video, I view it as kind of spoiler heavy. So we're going to focus right now on the Bladesworn authorization papers 
get the um, map meta of this map done, show you how to beat it, and then from there on, we're going to move on to kind of spoiler territory. So, uh, yeah, I'll see you then. So here we are after the small cut, like I mentioned. I'm right now, basically, uh, there's some pre-events that will need to be happening for the method to spawn. And if you're wondering what kind of meta I'm talking about, well, um, obviously the cut, I just put a cut in before getting to the um, gang war meta in the Echo Vault Wild. Yeah, this is the thing you need to get the... Um... Hold on a minute, I'm actually just going to check here. Kind of forget for a moment. It was the keenest cut, and then... Ah, yes, yeah, so Blades 1 Otherization Paper. So this is what you need to do for it. I don't remember this that, that well myself, but um, I also remember that um, the final boss for it is actually easier than the new Kining meta. So that's good news. So right now we're just following a commander, and um, as you can see, the commander just there down in, that, in the chat said that um, they don't know the meta that well, so I guess that makes two of us, because... It's been a long, long time since I've done this. So apparently the first step is just kill some Jade Brotherhood. Oh, and um, some of these enemies apparently, like that Jade Brotherhood champion enemy I was facing just then, had a, um, basically a magic instability. So when if you go bounty hunting in any of the Path of Fire maps, then occasionally you will end up finding a bunch of... Um, yeah, occasionally you, you end up finding a bunch of bounties that, well, not, not, not occasionally, but every single bounty, pretty much, has these different things about them called magic instabilities, and they are basically different types of things you should watch out for or avoid, that kind of stuff. So if you paid attention to the previous, um, basically the previous fight with that champion enemy, what was happening was um, he was spawning a whole bunch of these big white glowing orbs. That's the ley line instability. What you want to do, if that ever happens, is you want to run into the big glowing white orbs. That's actually a good thing, because if you do that, then you remove the ley line buildup, which is a hard to see purple buff debuff on your character, and that is a bad thing. Okay, so here I am back after the small cut, because I think this is something we generally sh generally should cover. Basically, I've just been following the commander, and you can kind of see where my white dot's been going. So I was over there before doing some kind of fight, and I basically followed them over here. We now had to clear this village here from Speaker Ritualists, and there is a Speaker Ritualist right here that we're fighting. However, in my personal opinion, he's a little bit of a pushover, but I thought I should just cover what you should be fighting here. Yeah, but generally, he has um, some kind of magic instability, like I was mentioning before, that Path of Fire um, enemies have, but, I mean, it, it doesn't really seem to be doing much. I, I would be just covering a little more, but I'm using pretty much like a, a really basic just power toughness build. Like, in fact, I've got, I've got soldier's gear on this character, which normally wouldn't be the best choice at all, but I mean, if you can beat this guy in soldier's gear, with people just mobbing him, you should be able to do the same thing. Oh, okay, this is really good. So, you remember the timer I was talking about at the top right of the screen? How I said that there's a certain amount of time you have before basically the meta will be counted as failing because one of the gangs will gain too much power and win, or at least that's how the um, law wise is explained. Really, it's the time running out and the game being like, oh, you failed, time run out. So, um, since we defeated the speakers in the village, in under 10 minutes, which honestly was actually kind of easy to do. I was expecting this to be a little bit harder, the method to be a little bit um, harder, at least at this part, but I'm glad, I'm really glad it's not. Um, basically, now it says go to the junkyard, and from what I remember, the junkyard is where you want to go because you face the big old boss right at the um, end of the meta. Oh, and um, again, apologies for the low frame rates like earlier, but there's not really much I can do. Okay, that's unique. So apparently here, what you're meant to do is talk to this dude here and he will give you siege turtles and then you use the uh, special action key to go and tell them to attack the um, Jade Brotherhood sentries with the mechs. And then once you do that, the um, turtle will remove the shield for you, letting you attack it. And I think the same also works where you can um, get the shield removed by just being in someone else's turtle. So a lot of people are actually getting on turtles and mounting up here. Anyway, I'm going to pretty much uh, skip ahead here again.
because all we have to do now is defeat the speakers, and that was the same as last time. Basically, you go and find the spirit presence or whatever have these cross sword icons above them, and you attack them. It's as simple as that. So I get back to you once the actual mech spawns, because this is kind of just busy work, and you know where to go in the junkyard now. Just coming back in here after the cut to explain one thing real quick. Well, pretty much, um, here we are up against a, um... A basically a speaker's lieutenant and a jade brotherhood lieutenant and we just have to defeat both of them i just wanted to cover that we're actually doing this but i'm going to put a quick cut in here real soon again because uh again they seem to be pushovers so there's not really much mechanics i actually have to cover here but yeah just generally letting you know that the next thing you will have to face is a uh, two complete pushover champion level lieutenants oh, i might actually not even need to put a cut in here because it says the prototype XJ1 um, has been corrupted and is on the top. Yes, yes, no cut needed. This is the huge, gigantic mech you have to fight. Yes, yeah, so actually, I'm, I'm just even looking at it. Apparently, this is jogging my memory or even refreshing it. So, one thing you want to do in this case, in my opinion anyway, is use a ranged weapon. Because, uh, especially if everything is as laggy as this. Because, holy crap. Also, uh, generally, um, when one of the um, NPCs here says, look out, and you don't need the actual um, voices on to hear this, one of the NPCs generally will just say, look out, and then you want to hide behind the, um, you want to hide behind the, one of these uh, little things here, these bits of jade junk. And it will perform like this gigantic slam attack, which you cannot actually dodge. And if you were to be hit by the slam attack, it would instantly down you. Just uh, no chance actually of just reviving yourself. You don't even go into the down state. You just just flat out dead. Also, if you've noticed, uh, I'm kind of walking in a weird way because this mech has got some kind of I don't know what. Like I guess I'm gonna call it a gravity generator because it keeps on pulling me constantly towards the um towards it so that's why what you want to do here if it does that is just um well backpedal do anything you can do use even use movement abilities just stay out of the way of the mech don't ever get close to it also yeah um i guess it hasn't even done its huge slam attack yet and i would say i'll be getting back to you when it's done that but i mean it, it's kind of randomized when it will do the slam attack and i don't want to miss it so I'm just going to stick around and record the entire mech fight, basically. I'll put cuts in it when the um, slam attack and other interesting stuff is actually happening. Also, yeah, um... Oh, in fact, there, there's a sort of thing. It's, it's like hide behind a trash pile. Oh, oh gee. Dead! <laughs> yeah, so I was trying to get to a trash pile there, but it was kind of hard to. Because, um, pretty much, as you can see there, the mech went and just, um, smushed everyone. <laughs> yeah, so... I may be using a sky scale here to get back to it, but honestly, if you die, you can just here. You can, I see, I see. I just went through this one waypoint, and then I kind of just followed the roads. And then also, e even though I had a sky scale and I was flying there, there's a bunch of um, jade zip lines around the place, which, if you remember, I covered that previously in when I was covering the new Kyling stuff. And uh, yeah, you can just use them to get back into the mech fight. And also, like I mentioned before, even if you are downed and killed, if you've done enough damage to the mech, you will count as getting gold completion for it. Oh dear, here's another one of the trash pile attacks. Let's see if I can actually do that. Nope. <laughs> okay, well that time at least I was actually like, far enough away to um to be able to go into the down mode. Ah. So there, luckily this one person is um nice enough to revive. <laughs> oh no! Oh, okay, that was... That was scary. <laughs> I didn't know it could do that. So apparently, yeah, the mech, while I was still down on the floor, it started sucking me in using its like, gravity well pop. Oh, oh, there it is again. Okay, this, this time I'm gonna do it. See? You're, you're, I'm doing it good. You stand in the, like, the, the little, um, the little blue circle. So yeah, what I'm gonna do here is, um, pretty much, since people went and revived me, I'm gonna revive them because that was real nice of them. But before, like I was saying, pretty much what happened was, um, it started using its gravity attack, gravity well attack, and it started sucking me into its, like, death field at the bottom of it while I was still down. I didn't even know that could happen. Also, welcome to Two Frame City! Yahoo! <laughs> oh, boy. And it gets better the moment I just don't look at people. 
Yeah, don't don't look at your huge crowd. That'll that'll help it. And of course, there's someone in the uh, map chat saying, "Man, this meta sucks so laggy." But yeah, generally everyone will start um dispersing after the um after the mech is killed. Right now, what I'm actually doing is uh, so I've got this one um mastery making it that um I can auto loot the big chest so that at the moment the mech die. That's why you saw a bunch of loot pot for me. But if we just zoom in a little here, there are like these blue chests here, which is what I'm pressing F on to open. And when you press F to open them, they actually just straight up just vanish. So just make sure that um, you go near the big old chest and you kind of just spam F a few times to get your thing. Okay, so one thing you may have noticed immediately after that quick transition is that I'm um, not on the same character. I'm in a different character. But rest assured, this character still is a warrior. I'm just playing on a different warrior right now. I went and switched characters because it just turns out that I'm up to the correct story step on this character for the Keenest Cut collection. So if we go over here and move over and just click on this again, like we have been doing so far, this one here, Notes and Building Flow. So the hint says here, as a warrior, complete the Ministry of Security Instance or Strike. I mean, story, uh, Ministry of Security Story Instance or Strike. Um, we're not going to be doing the strike here because, frankly, having already gotten into strikes and haven't learned them that well, we're going to do the story step instead. So that's what we're up to right now. If you want to go to it on the story journal, it's at End of Dragons at number 11, Name of the Lord. Okay. Now, to get on to the actual story mission, and trust me, I actually just went and um, looked up a guide for this online because I wanted to be prepared forehand, beforehand and not going into this just completely blind. And one thing I figured out is that the first few parts are just a calming, lovely, nice boat ride with one of the characters. So you, in that boat ride, like in said boat ride, you literally cannot lose. So, because of that fact that you literally cannot lose, I'm going to be skipping ahead into, uh, to all the parts of this where there actually is combat or various other points where you have to, where you can actually lose. Also, this collection here is not going to cover any of the achievements because they are kind of difficult to do. It, this is just for the collection. If you want to learn how to get the achievements, just you can uh, look up someone else's guide on YouTube. Anyway, enough blabbering. I'm going to get into the story mission now and skip ahead until there's actually points where you can um, lose at. Okay, so I said I'd get back to you when there is actually a point you can lose at, and that actually turns out it was now. In fact, some enemies surprised me, and I didn't really turn on the recording button because I kind of panicked and then fought them off. So I'm going to explain now. Uh, basically, through the story step, you have been told to go to here to Grub Lane, and you're meant to do the heart here at Grub Lane, which can involve a number of things, some of which are really easy to do and are pretty much require uh, no combat, such as getting on a springer, going up here to one of these unchained grubs, and just stomping on them. And that will get the bar filled for Grub Lane cleanup. However, if you want to get the bar filled really quickly, what you might end up doing is facing some of these uh, purists here. Basically, you don't have to worry about what their name is, they're just a certain type of enemy in the game. And honestly, uh, these can be quite deadly. Um, this guy here, well, of course, now that I'm actually recording, he, they end up being a little bit of a pushover. But trust me when I say before that three of them went and just ran out of one of the doors when I knocked on it. I actually wasn't expecting them. And then in the middle of the fight, when I defeated one of them, yes, I also got um, this thing in my hand. So this is actually perfect that this thing ended up just popping up in my hand. Uh, I'm going to show you what it is to, so you know how, what to look out for later. This is basically um, an eye of the ocean. It is um, pretty much this, uh, not really artifact, but it's, um, so, uh, sorry about that. So, basically, what the Eye of the Ocean is, it's, it's an item that you have to go over to one of these things here. They're like these special lantern things, and you're meant to just insert the Eye of the Ocean in there, and then they're meant to keep undead out of this district because undead are a major problem. But the main thing I wanted to cover there about the Eye of the Ocean is that sometimes you'll be facing an enemy, such as like three enemies, and then one of them will just give you the Eye of the Ocean immediately. It will just like pop into your hand, and you won't be able to actually fight the enemies while it's in your hand, because, um, yeah, it, the, game, the game disabled all your abilities while you're holding it. And uh, I'm not going to put another cut in here immediately, because these three ruffians here are actually purists in disguise, so the enemies of this area. So I'm going to hit them, and then they're immediately going to turn into, well, yeah, enemies that want to kill them. Well, not, not turn into, but they're going to drop their disguises. And this is more in line with um, the kind of fight that uh, I had before. Uh, give me a moment while I just try and uh, get back up there. That was not intentional. Oh, and it looks like they've almost reset. I say almost because they have it fully. Like, sometimes in, 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 when you uh, don't fight enemies for long enough in this game, 
they'll run back to their original places and recharge all their health, meaning you can't kind of just run in there continuously and attack them over and over and over again, slowly and slowly whittle them down. But yeah, as you can see, Purists here will definitely do a lot of damage. How I recommend beating them? For the cast of ones, get up in their face because they don't like that. And the other thing I recommend doing is defeat everything that's weaker first. So you see here, this Purist Mesmer, he's not a veteran. That Purist over there, the annoying one, the Necromancer, that keeps on like slinging all this icky green stuff at me. I don't even know what that is, probably just death magic or something. Yeah. Um, she is the one I'm going to ignore right now, because she's a veteran and therefore a, a harder to defeat. However, the more of them you kill, generally the, the easier it's going to be. Oh, and don't forget to switch to your ranged weapon as well, if like they keep on just covering the floor with all kinds of ink. And there you have it. That is pretty much how to defeat the Purits in the first part of this mission, the first part you can actually lose. Now I'm going to put another quick cut in and we're going to skip past the lovely boat ride with Rama because even though it's very scenic, like I mentioned before, you can't really lose. Even if you get off the boat, Rama just says, why you do that? You drop him in the water and then you can continue from there. So I'll see you then. So here we are after the small cut and we're at this next part of the story which just says beat up the bigots. So pretty much it's just this person down here, they're actually a hero point. Which means the great thing about this is even if you find this to fight hard, which honestly in my opinion this guy's kind of a pushover, you can kind of just wait around here and probably someone will come along wanting to do this hero point because, well, they want to unlock their new class, such as Blade Sworn or whatever. So basically you choose the option of the cross swords and just start fighting him. Another also great thing about this is that once you defeat him, he, since he's a hero point, a combat one, you get a little reward for your trouble. So you even kind of get it paid for the story step before it's even finished, which, um, I mean, I find that awesome. Who wouldn't want to get that? Oh yeah, also, since he's a veteran, as you can see there, um, abilities that can stun him, such as my headbutt, where I just clonked him in the noggin, actually work, so get yeah, even better. Also, apparently, his minions can't do crap. And, uh, oh, and another thing is, apparently also, falling off the edge like that doesn't really matter either. And by the look of it also, his um, death fields and stuff aren't really affecting me that much either, so I'm generally just gonna stand right here while I just hit him. Oh, look at that. Because they defeated him, actually made his minions friendly, but they're gonna just die soon. Yep, so there you have it. That's the uh, beat of the bigots for the story step completed. And now the characters are gonna talk a bunch. You're gonna be sent to some kind of building, ministry building, and you have to, like, then talk with more people and then present evidence and stuff. But I'll just cut right to the chase and uh, get back to you once we're actually at the next big fight, which is the hardest part of um, this story step. So I'll see you then. And here we are after that cut. Uh, there was the short elevator ride, and I'm starting to record now, even though nothing's happening yet, because there's going to be a fight very soon with all these NPCs that have just like, so, so, so politely lined up there, and also um, this guy. Yeah, so it's meant to be kind of as a surprise. That's why the characters would be sounding surprised if they didn't have the sound off. But um, I already know what happens here. So yeah, that's why I started recording now because I know the fight was going to happen. So to start off, this is the, also by the way, this is the, the big fight I was mentioning before in the um recording. To start off, you will just verse one single enemy at a time. It will be this guy, the enforcer. Now his whole shtick is um. He'll just try and jump around the place and leave these fiery trails. Um, the trick to that is ignore the fiery trails, pull out your ranged weapon when he does them, and just shoot him. Because uh, who cares about the fiery trails when you never really step in them like I'm doing here. Also, if you're wondering what this little purple icon above my character's head is, that is pretty much the enemy is fixated in you icon. It actually appears in a couple of armed um, fractals. Where, like, for instance, in this one fractal, there was this big dredge-like piece of mining equipment that a dredge, like a mining suit that, um, pretty much like a mech like a, that a dredge, what dredge was using. And whenever you got that purple icon on someone, that means that the enemy is, like, attacking them, so you better pay attention. But in this case, if you're doing this mission solo, and I'm assuming you are, and don't have anyone with you, the purple icon won't mean anything at all because all the only people in this instance will be what well, will not just the person will be you, and then there's also Rama, the NPC, which is helping you here. So that was the first enemy kind of well not really defeated there, but once you damage these enemies enough, they'll kind of just 
piss off for a little while and then come back later. So the next enemy you have is just the Ritualist, and as you can see here, his um actual attacks are downright pathetic. Like he's not doing any damage at me on me whatsoever with his stupid little staff, but he does make these area effect fields on the floor that can be a little bit damaging. But as you can see there, I defeated him easy enough. Then this person here, the Mind Blade, will kind of make these area effect fields that will kind of then spread out and go along the place. But again, there I just kind of backed up and got out my ranged weapon because uh, do I really need to go in close combat when the floor is pretty much lava? Like, maybe that one game? No, not really, I don't think so. I can just I can just smack them from a distance. Well, not really smack them, but shoot them from a distance. And then when they decide to come in closer, I, I don't really care since um, my class is a warrior. Like, I'm built for close combat. I can just pull up the great sword, whatever you have it. Next, what'll happen is um, there'll be this sniper here trying to shoot you. But Rama is a blade sworn, one of the new specializations, so he'll just deploy this lovely little shield here. Just stay behind it, and the sniper won't be able to do anything to you. And then the next part of the fight here will be this Jade Mech. And as you can see, it does deploy a lot of area effect fields, including this one here, where like it shoots this giant laser. But honestly, it's kind of slow. Like, really, really slow. So you should be able to just dodge out of the way of everything here. Like, I don't think I've gotten hit once so far. And um, I'm not really even like <laughs> actually using the dodge key that much here. It's more just, you know. Run around in a circle. <laughs> well, so I guess like this tactic here is just it's just kinda of doing wonders for me. I, I guess I am paying like a bit of attention here to actually like, defeat this enemy, but hey, this isn't that hard here. And this is also what I was talking about with like the food really coming in handy, so here it's like helping me do a lot more damage. But um I guess the buff from the anvil here isn't actually affecting me that much because it would affect me if I actually got hit more. And then once that's done, you move on to actually fighting Minister Lee here, who is also a Blade Sworn. So because of this, watch out for his extremely deadly attacks. But you know what the good news is? This is Blade Sworn's in a nutshell. This is how the player works as well. Like if you ever play a Blade Sworn, you know exactly what Lee's doing here. Basically, the whole thing is that they charge up these attacks, and they take forever to charge them up. But if they hit you, they do heaps of damage. But you see, that's the good thing here. If they hit you. Lee is taking so long here to actually wind up each individual attack, like, Oh boy, I'm gonna charge it, you better watch out! I'm just like, I'm on the other end of the room already. <laughs> you can't hit me. Oh yeah, there's the part where I guess it's a little bit more deadly. He'll like fire these really quick bursts, but again, the tactic here is really just... run around him, straight from the circle. He can't really actually hurt you. And the, here, like, there is some kind of blue field you can stand in. I'm assuming it's the field that you will use to, like, revive Detective Rama if you stand in it. But, um, there I was generally just ignoring it because I wanted to stay out of the way of Minister Lee's attacks and I didn't want to be downed again. And then what he'll do is he'll, like, shush, put, put you over to this platform. And now you verse multiple of his minions at the same time. And they generally like to just... Like just put massive AOE fields all over the place, but um the good news about this is as you can see there I was able to dodge them even while adjusting my camera slightly Because you're versing the same enemies as you were before and as you remember some of them are utter pushovers like the ritualist Um don't even have to really worry about him the enforcer might be a bit of a big deal in the mind blade I guess kind of but like I mean in this case what I recommend doing actually is just uh pick on the weaker one so just hit the Rigilist a whole bunch and get him out of the picture. Because, um, as I explained before, when defeating the speakers, if you attack one of the enemies here and manage to defeat them, then you're going to have to be dealing with less enemies the entire fight. So generally just focus fire one of them. Oh, and if you're curious what kind of uh, class I'm playing here, it's the, I mean specialization, of course I'm playing Warrior. It's the Heart of Thorn specialization Berserker. So that's how I'm able to do that thing where, like, I spin my greatsword around like a giant Beyblade. Also really fun, in my opinion. Ah, and here we have just the Enforcer. Apparently, he was, uh, the best of the bunch? Most tanky? I don't know. Either way, he's still going to be defeated in just a moment. And then here there's stage 2, 
facing Minister Lee. I'm going to put a cut in here because I mean it's going to be the same as before. You don't need to hear me constantly talk about defeating Minister Lee. So if he has any new in me mechanics that he introduces, then I'll uh, cut back into the video. But otherwise, I'm going to just skip ahead until the next part of this boss fight happens. It's actually different than the rest of the stuff so I can actually guide you on what to do. So here we are at the next part of the boss fight, and the reason why this part here is different is because uh, basically I defeated Mr. Lee enough, and now we have a new character um, coming in to try and fight me, the Sniper. So the thing about her is that when she first attacked me, she had this um, basically, well, as you remember, uh, um, Rama there was basically shielding me before, and he said get behind my shield, and he protected me from Sniper bullets. This is actually the one who was firing at me. And as you can see here, her general uh, deal is that she'll try and, well, attack you from above, like that. That's actually what you missed out on in the original part of this fight. Generally, it's I haven't really figured out a good way to actually dodge this prop, like dodge her attack properly. She'll generally just charge up her sniper bullet, and the thing is, it'll constantly be like a, a yellow, like little line on you, and. At some point, she'll decide to fire. I guess the best thing to do is look off into the distance and pay attention to where she actually is and how she's aiming her weapon, so you can kind of use that to decide when you should actually go and take her out. But, I mean, not take her out, but like dodge her bullet. Like here, here she says like night night, so I'm just waiting for her to actually fire. And uh, I guess, there, there, I try to dodge, but um, I guess this is in general just very hard to dodge, but I would recommend actually going and taking her out first because the mech is a lot tougher than her. Like the mech is generally, it has a lot more health. So even though all, those, all its area effects are like annoying and stuff, I'm just constantly going for her instead because she's, um, in my opinion, more deadly in a more pressing matter. Like if her sniper bullet can take me down instantly from far, I'd rather have her out of the picture. Anyway, enough talking for me, I'm going to skip past the this mech and uh, sniper fight. Okay, so the mech and sniper are defeated, and as you could probably guess, the fight got a lot easier once I was able to defeat the sniper. The mech was actually, uh, one thing I ended up failing to record there, but um, I might as well just explain it there, is the mech was kind of easy to dodge at that point, because um, it was generally like, I could just run around it? and not really bothered about a lot of its attacks, it would sometimes actually get confused and take a very long time to kind of slowly turn around and go, ooh, this person is actually behind me, oh, I better turn around and like face them immediately then. But yeah, also, if we go into our inventory here, uh, where is it? Well, maybe not our inventory, but yeah, if we go into the keenest cut, yeah, um, notes on building flow, we actually have it here. In fact, it actually just popped up on the screen before, if you saw. So that pretty much covers it for this part of the collection. Now that everyone's defeated, all the characters will talk, and this story step will just be completed once they finish talking. So, that's this part. Hope it didn't take too long, hope I didn't draw out the fight too much, and um, on to the next part of this um, entire, uh, not questline, collection, that's the one I was looking for. Okay, so now that the Echo Wilds, Echo Wilds meta event is over and done with, and we have the Blade Sworn authorization papers, the next thing I'm going to cover is a bunch of stuff from the last map in the game. So if you haven't already completed the story and you don't want spoilers, click off the video now, uh, complete the story, because one of these steps will actually need you to complete the story anyway in order to buy this thing, so you'd really be doing yourself a favor. Or if you don't care about spoilers and want to know beforehand, keep on watching uh, your choice, whatever you do. But I also will mark in the uh, playback bar that this will be kind of spoilers. So. Let's get on with it. Um, the first thing we're going to need to do is get to the last map, which is, um, as you can see over here, uh, Dragon's End. And in order to get there, well, I already know that we would have ha we would have uh, Mori Village unlocked because we went there before. So we are going to. That's why we are starting at Mori Village, and then we're just going to go north across this map here, across this water, and we're basically getting to. Um, we're basically going over and getting to the uh, end of uh, uh, Dragon's End map. So just using the skimmer there because it's faster across the water and now I'm um, switching to the raptor in case you're wondering why I'm switching mounts all of a sudden. The 
And so our plan, uh, my plan here is just get to the nearest bunch of roads, because if they want some other road, I'll be able to follow the roads and have a direct path that will lead me to the final map. And it's better than just blundering around this map and not knowing where you're going. So you can see, I went up here, kind of, a, I guess, hit a bit of a dead end without already knowing it. And now we're just going to go up to this waypoint, the Jade Gate waypoint. This waypoint will sometimes be contested, but I really recommend getting it anyway. Because this is like your one-stop shop and ticket to get to the final map. I don't know what that little screen that popped up there was that happened. It just popped up really, really quickly and then just went away as soon as I kind of well, only popped for half a second. Okay, so like normal, I have skipped through the loading screen and now we are in the uh, final map of the game. And the first thing we are going to cover in the Guinness Cut collection is the volatile explosive um, ore chunk which you get by mining jade nodes, which only spawn on this map, by the way, as a warrior. So it doesn't actually have to be on this character, but you're leveling up a blade sworn and want to play it on when we mine a node on a different warrior, you can. The character just must be a warrior full stop, that's all you need. Uh, another thing is, either you will need an unlimited tool or you need an oracalium mining pick to actually mine the jade node properly. So yeah, that, that is generally two things. And also, the said jade you will get from this jade node will go towards a um, another item on this list. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone, or so the analogy goes. So, while going around this map, in order to find the jade, just keep an eye on your mini-map. And look for any uh, symbols of ore that are mining nodes. And also, Good Wars 2 has got a neat little feature where when you mouse over one of the mining nodes, it will tell you if it's a jade mining node or not. So example, great example here. Here we have a mithril ore and another mithril ore. So we don't have to go near them to know that's not what we're looking for. We're just gonna look over here again. And we have another mithril ore. So I'm gonna put a quick cut in here and get back to you once I found an actual damn jade node around here. Because all of these so far just seems to be mithril ore. And uh, you definitely know what it looks like when you find it. Ah, uh, here we are, bingo. This is what we're looking for, a jade-eyed vein. So you just go up to it, and then you mine it, it looks like this green thing, and you get pure chunks of jade from this. And there you have it, it's mined. And um, generally, the thing to remember with these is that you probably won't get the chunk of, like, uh, destroyed jade ore on the first go. So you may need to mine a couple of these, but yeah, just that's generally what to look for. Um, keep looking for them all over the map until you um, eventually mine enough that you get the item. And then you can sell it because it's a useless grey item that can be sold to vendors. So, that is the volatile explosive chunk covered. The next thing we're going to cover is the badge of lacerating. So, for the badge of lacerating, the best way to figure out what to do is to go over to the Keenest Cut collection, again, like I have. And then mouse over it, and the hint will actually tell you exactly what you need to create it, which I'm going to go over. So, for this, to create this, you will need 25 globs of ectoplasm, 25 chunks of jade, 25 chunks of echovald resin, and an oracalium pistol barrel. And then you need to combine them all in the Mystic Forge. How do you get all these things? Well, each and every one of them can be bought off the trading post. If we just click here, then go down here. One of the recent things I should I should have looked up. Okay, apparently it's not showing up here. But we can type in. Yeah, we can type in oiled oricalium pistol, and then it should show up. Yeah, here we are. Um, an oiled oricalium pistol barrel. So. The reason why this costs so much on the trading post is because it is a bit difficult to get. As you can see there, it's got the word Huntsman with um, 400 near it in the words red. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. This is basically telling you that in order to craft this thing, you will need a level 400 Huntsman, which means that you either have to have one of your own characters as a level 400 Huntsman to craft this item, you have to have a friend who's willing to craft this for you and mail it to you, someone else is willing to mail it to you, or 
you need to buy this off the trading post because there's no real other way to get this. Also, in order to craft the Oracalium pistol barrel, oil, oil Oracalium pistol barrel, I looked up on the wiki, you will need flax, which is worth quite a bunch of money at the time of recording this, because I'm actually recording this part at a later date, because I need to re-record it. The other part was shit, so I'm doing this better now. And yeah, flax at the time of recording is worth quite a bit. It may go down when this is finally released. I don't know, just market prices, prices change. And the other thing you'll need is orocalium, which is also usually worth a pretty penny. So that is pretty much the orocalium pistol barrel. Everything else can be bought off the trading post. If, for example, we just type in chunk of jade, it will show up right here, the chunk of pure jade. Now, the thing is, chunks of pure jade is actually something I wouldn't recommend buying off the trading post, since in a previous segment of this video that actually happened really, really recently, in fact, I'm pretty sure it happened just before this, we were out in the End of Dragons map trying to get the busted up chunk of jade, this thing here, the expo volatile explosive ore chunk, which you got from pure jade veins, and in my opinion, just go out there with Oracalium pick, um, mining pick and mine enough p chunks of pure jade to go get the thing. Just go, well, mine 25 of them and then you should be good. For the chunk of, pu of petrified echo valve resin, the very, very simple way to go get that is just go into the Echo Vile Wild. So here we are in Arborstone. You just go out here, and I'm going to put um, a link in the well, not, well, not in the description and also over here right now, pretty much to this well, going to this one channel called Unskippable Cutscene because he goes and basically lays out a route you can take around here to get lots and lots of Echo Vile resin. If you don't want the Echo Vile resin then you can of I mean, if you don't want to get it by just chopping all the trees around here, which you also will need an Oracalium uh, axe for, then you can just buy it straight up off the trading post. Now, for the globs of ectoplasm, I, what I recommend doing is a tiny bit of a roundabout way of getting them, so you could always just buy them off the trading post, but the reason why I'm going to recommend this method here is it can potentially get you more money and be worth your time more. So the reason why I type rare in the uh, trading post thing in the search bar is because we're looking at pieces of rare unidentified gear. It's gone down in price uh, by the time I'm recording this, but it may go up. It's currently worth about 14 silver, and ec uh, an ectoplasm is worth 16 silver on the trading post, so ectoplasm is worth more. So what I recommend doing is buying about 25 pieces of rare identified gear and then identifying the unidentified gear by double clicking it, making it appear as actual well, gear in your inventory. And then once you've done that, check what it's worth in the trading post because you may identify some gear and it may be a great sword, a two handed rare great sword, which is usually worth more than a single glob of active ectoplasm or a, a bunch of, uh, oh, a single bit of unidentified gear. And then you can sell it in the trading post and use that to buy, buy globs of ectoplasm. But if it's worth, if the, identified piece of gear is worth less than an unidentified piece of gear, like before you double click it, then just either use a master salvage kit, which is the yellow grade salvage kit, a mystic salvage kit, or a black lion salvage kit, which is the highest grade, which you usually get from login rewards. If we just go over here, these rewards here, these chests of black lion goods may sometimes contain a black lion salvage kit, but that isn't guaranteed. Okay, now that that's all that's covered, the next thing you will need in order to craft the Badge of Laceration is a Mystic Forge. There are a couple of ways you can get to one. One way is if you have a premium item in your inventory or shared inventory like I do have here, you could just go to one of these places and they nearly always, all of them nearly always have a Mystic Forge. In fact, it's pretty much guaranteed. So this is, takes me to the Lily of the Elon, which is like a VIP place in the, des in the um, Crystal Oasis. This takes me to the Mistlock Sanctuary, which isn't on actually any map, but I really like it and it's a good premium item. Also, if you level up the, let me just go to the end of the dragons thing here. If you level up the Arborstone Revitalization Mastery, I got a feeling that around the this one or this mastery um point, uh, well, this mastery um advancement thing, the um a Mystic Forge will then appear in Arborstone, which I am in now. Also, if you level up Arborstone enough, then it will get you this teleporter here which you can then just step on for a few seconds. It will take you up to the second level, 
and then you can go through this gate to Lion's Arch in order to get to the um in order to get to the Mystic Forge. So the best way generally actually to get to the Mystic Forge is World vs. World. There is a Mystic Forge in World vs. World, so the only thing you gotta look out for is this little red number with the um tiny I'm gonna zoom in here so you can actually see it. The tiny little um basically hourglass icon here. If you see this, this means that heaps of people queued up to enter a, a, a one of these world versus world maps, which means that um, there's going to be a queue for you to get in, just like what World of Warcraft servers first launched. So you want to, what you want to try and do is find one of these maps and then go there when there is no queue. And now I'm going to cut past the short loading screen. Okay, so now that we've gotten past, gotten past that really short loading screen that I pretty much skipped, what you now want to do is, since you're in the World of the World, you want to go around your main fort and look for a Mystic Forge because your main fort will actually have a Mystic Forge. This is usually where you spawn in in World vs. World. Um, your Mystic Forge will usually be in the um, World vs. World zone that you control. So I, my server uh, in Guild Wars 2 is Tarnished Coast, so that's why I picked this, the Tarnished Coast Alpine Borderlands. Basically, you look at what your server is called, minus Tarnished Coast, you find out it's green, okay, Tarnished Coast equals green because of this, and then this also says Tarnished Coast. You go to the World vs. World Borderlands that is got your name, and then you generally just walk around here until you find said Mystic Forge. If it's not in this first giant fort here, then I know as a, for a fact it will be in the other giant fort. This one down here. In fact, I'm pretty sure it may be in here. Unfortunately, unlike um, Lion's Arch, there is no real Mystic Forge um, locator thing on the minimap. In fact, yep, here it is. Mystic Forge attendant. Here is the Mystic Forge. So all you have to do now is press F to use it like I was before, and then throw in the old oil or oracalium pistol barrel. Uh, the 25 globs of ectoplasm, the 25 chunks of jade or of jade or um, yeah, pure jade, and also the echo Vard resin. Click forge, and it will give you a badge of lacerating. Which at the time of recording, I went and salvaged because I didn't need any more. But if you, but remember that it's um, account bound, so it can be freely given between characters, and it's also account select, stat selectable. So you can right click on it and choose stats that you think will benefit one of your characters, and that is pretty much. That's, that's pretty much it for how to get the badge of lacerating. Now we can move on to the next part of the guide. Hopefully that was nice and short and didn't take too long. So here we are, finally, after a long arduous journey, we are at the end of the guide. You finally have your very own Keenest Cut, which I know that sounds weird to say, but I mean, that's the name of the pistol and it's... unique. You can only get one of them per account, I guess. So yeah, that actually did make sense with what I said. So first off, congratulations on doing it, here's a celebratory Magicka Victory screen for you. Here you go. Yeah, that's uh, from one of my favorite games, Magicka, pretty much a game where you uh, wizards and you uh, can blow each other up. It's vaguely medieval themed with um, uh, Vietnam weapons thrown in there. I'm not joking, they actually had an expansion pack all about Vietnam. So. This is where I would be ending the guide, pretty much right there, but I wanted to cover one last thing, and that is the stat combinations that you can pick for the keenest cut, because I haven't picked them yet, and I decided, hey, I'm going to record myself picking it. So we're going to click the customize thing here, we're going to right click on keenest cut, customize it, and because it is an ascended weapon, a special ascended weapon, you only have three stat combinations to choose from, you can't actually choose any others. So, what would I recommend out of these? Honestly, in my opinion, these are some of the best three stat combinations I've seen that you can pick from, from like, a lot of weapons, because I guess, they're, I guess they're really good to me, because they're some of my favorites. So, here we got Berserkers, which is all just about doing more crit damage and power damage, and yeah, that kind of stuff. Then we got, um... Dragons, which gives you a little more health, a little more precision, and then also a little more crit damage as well. And we got Knights, which gives you more precision, no crit damage, but gives you more toughness and also more power. Uh, personally, I think I'm going to pick Dragons because it just seems the most 
versus uh, actually, yeah, I'm going to pick dragons because it pretty much seems. I can't decide. Yeah, I'm going to pick knights. Knights is just one of my uh, favorite stat combinations. But yeah, generally, any of these stat combinations works really well, in my opinion. They're all great. There is uh, actually one last thing after that that I want to cover, and that is now that you have the keenest cut, I recommend that you never ever really salvage it, and here's why. Because uh, here we have the Berserker's Blade Sworn Pistol of Corruption. So this thing here was basically the pistol I unlocked right at the start of the collection that I mentioned right at the start. If you missed that, we're skipping ahead using the time codes and stuff. So this thing here is soulbound, meaning only this char pur purple wearing char here can use it. The keenest cut, however, can be used by any character, so it's account bound because it's account bound. So that's why I recommend keeping it no matter what, because if you were to get bored of Bladesworn or something, or Anet decides to nerf it, which I guess they've been nerfing some classes uh, recently at the time of actually finally recording this, but may have changed when I actually edit and upload it. Uh, anyway, uh, if they were to nerf or you no longer enjoy your class, you can take the keenest cut off your character and give it to another character that can use guns. And there is a I guess, fair amount they can use them. Top of my head, I can think of Engineer can definitely use pistols. Thief can definitely use pistols. And, uh, oh yeah, Mesmer can also use pistols in their offhand slot. So, pretty much the knight stack combination, power, precision, and toughness. I mean... If you're going for that kind of build, it's kind of good, and even if you're not going for that kind of build, a little bit of precision and a little bit more toughness might be useful in a lot more uh, in a lot of um, fights and locations and stuff like that. But yeah, generally, um, that's pretty much it. That's enough for this guide. I'm going to end it right here, because I'm pretty sure after editing, it's going to be over an hour long, even after chopping out the useless bits, which is a lot of watch time. So thanks a whole heap if you decide to watch the entire thing, uh, if you decide to skip around or anything like that, I don't mind either way. I just want you to get this dang gun. Anyway, that's it. Uh, bye. I'm leaving now. Guys, over.